Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, this week, I'm very excited to announce uh, that we have Simone Eola uh, speaking to us. Uh, Simone is the uh, data and pipeline lead, a uh, group leader at uh, the Flatiron, uh, and he's also the leading data management, I'm sorry, uh, at, for the Simons Observatory. Uh, but he's done all sorts of amazing work with ACT. Uh, he, he's led some of the you know, most cutting edge analyses of cosmological data. Uh, and now he's uh, working to, to get even more of it uh, from the odd comma. So uh, take it away, Simone. Thank you so much, Zach. I've learned that I'm your first, uh, the first person you're hosting. So for that too. I'm excited. And my first time in Toronto, I'm glad that the, the weather is today is beautiful. So we should probably be outside, but I'll, I'll cut it short and then we can go out. <laughs> uh, but yeah, today I would like to tell a little bit more about the cosmology that we do uh, from the Atacama Desert using uh, CMB maps. Of course, there is all sorts of cosmology that you can do from there uh, in the optical radio. Uh, but I've been working mostly on, uh, on the millimeter wavelength. And I understand that to this audience, I, didn't, I don't need to tell you what the CMB is, uh, but you may not be uh, very familiar with uh, all the uh, services that are out there uh, to map the CMB. And so I hope to give you a little bit of a current status of the field or how we're observing the sky, what we're gonna do uh, next. Again, from the Atacama Desert, there is a lot more. I'll mention some other surveys. And uh, specifically, I'll be talking about some of the work that I've done um, when I was in Princeton on, on ACT data. Um, so here is a brief, of, uh, a brief outline. Um, I want to tell you what is the what was the um, the status of CMB cosmology, basically before the data release for of ACT, which really means the the final Planck data release. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit of the work that we've done in, with the ACT collaboration with this uh, ACT DR4. Um, this is probably the last talk you'll hear about ACT DR4 because very soon. <laughs> Act year six should be come out, and so new brand new results uh, from the Atacama Cosmology Telescope. And so I just want to give you a flavor of what's coming next. And then uh, the next 10 years, we'll probably hear a lot about the Simons Observatory. And I have the fortune to work uh, in this in this project. And so I will tell a little bit of where we're at right now and uh, what we uh, we plan to do. And you, as part of the community, might be using this this data in the future. Um, so as promised, I don't need to tell you what the CMB is, but I need to have one slide. Uh, and I love this one. And I just think that is really fascinating, the fact that we can study the universe with this oldest light. Uh, and it is a pretty pristine light. It comes from very far away uh, and reaches us. But the also very interesting thing is that it gets affected uh, throughout the journey towards us by all sorts of things, uh, structure, and that shows up in, in lensing. Uh, clusters that bring uh, hot and cold spots in the in the CMB at different frequencies, uh, foregrounds, the galaxy, everything. And we can see everything in these maps. Uh, you can do all sorts of cosmology, but also astrophysics and galactic uh, science. Um, and we are able to reconstruct all these effects and, and often separate them. And I find still very, um, very fascinating. And I guess is the thing that kind of keeps me doing this. Um, so, uh, I'll be talking about most about the CMB and uh, we can answer all sorts of questions or at least we can hope to do that. Uh, basically just looking at the statistics of these maps that we, we make from the Atacama Desert. Uh, and here you see a very familiar plot. Um, here you have the variance of the CMB maps uh, as function of the scale. Here is uh, the variance if you look at the uh, temperature fluctuations. Whereas you can look at the polarization properties of the map, these maps, and you can divide that in two different fields. This is the E mode field and the B mode field. And depending on the different aspects of physics, whether you're looking at lambda CDM, if you want to characterize inflation, if you're looking at uh, later time ionization or uh, the astrophysics that affects the small scales, you can see that these variants as a structure that is dependent on that on that physics effect, physical effect that you would like to. Uh, to try to characterize. And so we have many questions that are still open and the CMB can help uh, answer those. Uh, what was the honor, honor, origin of our universe? Uh, we're really looking into understanding if inflation has happened and how it looks like. 
uh, but also elementary particle physics, such as neutrinos, they do affect how the structure grows in the universe and does they affect the CMB and uh, its properties. Um, and so, for example, looking at the absolute neutrino uh, mass scale, or are there other relics in the, in the, in the universe that uh, are affecting this, uh, these maps that we haven't seen yet? Uh, nature of dark matter, uh, many people here looking at axions, uh, and so the CMB is very powerful for that. Uh, what's the nature and the physics of dark energy, but also later, uh, the later universe, the cosmic dawn, uh, how, what was the physical effect and how uh, has affected the, the path of those CMB uh, photons towards us. So these simple statistics, nothing really complicated, you're looking at power spectra of, of maps, can actually tell you a lot about the, the, uh, the physics of our cosmos. And so in 2018, uh, Planck has published their final results. And here you can see a status of the field in 2018. You can see Planck in blue, uh, mapping the temperature, the E mode polarization, the B mode polarization. Here you can see also the cross correlation between the temperature and the E mode um, polarization. You expect them to be correlated and I'll show you later why. But, and also the effect of lensing from the, the, the structure uh, that is in between the last scattering surface and us. And here on top of Planck, you see uh, early double map and all the other experiments that have followed from the ground. And you can see here that all these experiments are narrowing down a beautiful model that is the Lambda CDM model. And it seems to work uh, very, very well. All these acoustic peaks are very mapped out, very well mapped out and, and all these experiments agree. And so uh, in 2018, um, Planck uh, basically said that Lambda CDM works the six parameters are a good fit to the model in both temperature and polarization, and um, uh, as well as for the for the lensing and the, the cross collision between temperature and, and E mode. Um, these parameters are very tightly constrained at this point, and you can actually see that uh, Planck has almost reached the limit within lambda CDM. You can't do a lot better in lambda CDM with more and more data. Uh, you sort of saturate your constraining power. You, pow, um, power. you can do a little bit more in polarization to try to test if there are models, uh, if, if your model doesn't work in polarization versus temperature, but pretty much you're done with lambda CDM. So what we really wanna do moving forward is beyond and understanding if there is something new in our universe. And of course, there are some um, things that don't quite work well, and I'm pretty sure you have heard about the h not tension. And actually, let's stop a second about on, on that. So if you look on the CMB uh, side of things, uh, double map was able to constrain H0. They found 70 uh, plus or minus two, roughly. Um, ACT came along, and if you combine the double map data with the first two years of ACT temperature data, you can see that uh, these two uh, values are very consistent. The error bars are slightly smaller, just a little bit. Act doesn't add a whole lot, but they're definitely consistent. And then the final release of Planck uh, finds this value uh, that is around, I don't know, a little bit more of 67 plus or minus 0.5. Now you can, uh, this is an early uh, universe estimate of the, the Hubble parameter. And then you can compare that with uh, what you find in, uh, in the low redshift universe from supernovae 1a. And if you calibrate the supernovae with either Cepheids or the tip of a red giant branch, you can see that these two measurements are not in full agreement. And specifically, if you compare this, the Planck measurement with the Cepheids, there is a very big discrepancy. And of course, between the early and the late time universe, there is a whole lot that can happen that we don't know. And so you would like to say, or um, would be very excited if you know, this is really new physics uh, to explore. But of course, I wanted to point out that this was the Planck measurement. And of course, Planck has seen little deviations from lambda CDM in their data, not statistically significant, but things that you may wonder, maybe this is a systematic effect. Is Planck really seeing this? Is this value really 67? Why is not 70? If you bring this slightly towards 70, this would be a much better agreement with all the measurements. So we really want to test Planck. And so with ACT, we realized maybe that's what we can do. We can actually test this measurement and understand what the, this value for the CMB is, not just for Planck, but really understanding what's the value for the CMB and either confirm what Planck has seen and confirm this tension or um, correct this value and, and understand how to move forward. So what's beyond Planck? 
Uh, this is mostly a summary plot. As I said, I'll show a bunch of things to, to you know, uh, explain a little bit the status of the field, but I will focus on uh, a subset of this. Here on this plot, I have I have the resolution in arc minutes. Here you have high resolution, here you have lower resolution, and then the sky area. Of course, the two satellites, WMAP and Planck. Uh, and today I will be talking about ACT, which is a high resolution instrument around one arc minute, 150 gigahertz. And with ACT, we are covering roughly 40% of the sky. With the Simons Observatory, which I will talk towards the end, we are actually trying to push this even further up and try to cover more than half of the sky. And then there is another component of the Simons Observatory that I'll mention just for completeness, which are these uh, small aperture telescopes that are really trying to look at um, you know, lower resolution uh, and lower part of the sky to try to tackle things like inflation, but we'll mostly talk about, uh, about the lab. And you can see that here I've uh, collected things that are in space in Chile and in the South Pole. Uh, in Chile, we also have class and uh, polar bear in the Simons Array. Uh, I never been to the South Pole. I heard that is an, an amazing place to do to do science. And our colleagues, especially in SPT, which is the counterpart of ACT and the South Pole, uh, it's an amazing instrument. Um, but it they are very complementary sites. And mm -hmm. if you've heard about CMBS4, or if you you work in, in CMBS4, you know that as this bigger Uber CMB project, we want really both sides to be part of this collaboration. And so now we're trying to pioneer as much science as we can uh, in, in Chile before we, we go to, to South Pole. And why Chile? Um, here you see a map of our planet and color coded is the amount of water vapor that you have in the sky. And you can see that you really have four spots where you can do CMB analysis, or I should say microwave uh, analysis because water is actually not uh, a friend uh, for us. And you have the South Pole, you have Chile, you have Greenland and you have Tibet. Uh, here a little bit more detail if you really care about this, but you can see the windows uh, of observations and you can see that at around 90 gigahertz and 150 gigahertz, you have a minimum of the, uh, the emissions for water that is that varies as function of the amount of water that you have uh, in your atmosphere. You can see what is called here the PWV, uh, the same here. And so you can see that we can observe at 90 gigahertz and 150 gigahertz and those two bands are very, very good for CMB observation. One thing that makes though Chile really, really good for these sort of uh, experiments, you can see here. So on the x-axis, you have the lowest elevation that you can observe. So from zero, you go down to 90. And assuming that you can go, well, sorry, from 90, you go to zero. And assuming that you can go all the way to zero, that's not really true because you, you have the ground around you, but let's pick 30. You can see that actually for a 30 degree lowest elevation with your telescope, from Chile, you can cover almost 80% of the sky. Whereas if you're at the pole, you can barely cover 30% of the sky. So the nice part of being in Chile is that you can actually cover a ton of sky without going to space and still being high resolution because you can afford to have a very big mirror, a very big telescope to survey your uh, your CMB uh, sky. So it's a really, really good sweet spot. And we are trying to really make this the treasure of CMB in, in Chile, try to map as much sky as we can. So let me show you the real heroes of all of this. This is us at one of the collaboration meetings. Um, this is the ACT collaboration. And so all the work that I've done wasn't just my work. It's a lot of a lot of people from building the, the, the telescope, running it, characterizing the data, just give your shoulders to cry. A lot of people like they really work with you <laughs> to make this happen. That analysis that I'm gonna present lasted for a very long time because this is hard to do. Uh, when you have data that you never seen before. And here, just as a candy, you can see how the site looks like. You're basically on Mars. Uh, everything is right now around you. This is the plateau in Chile. Uh, it's really hard to breathe there. If you go it's, and you try to move, you regret it. Uh, but here you can see we have ACT uh, with this big telescope and a bunch of other experiments. Um, and it's a gigantic telescope. Those are six meters. Well, those, this is the, the primary mirror, six meters. Uh, she's a, she was a postdoc at that time, <laughs> uh, and um, that's how the telescope moves, and here there is the receiver with all these detectors, uh, detectors that work in extremely cold environment uh, because this CMB is, 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 uh, is very hard to detect, so you need to remove the possible noise. And the thing you have, the sky moving uh, 
uh, above the telescope, you keep scanning it. You can do that overnight, of course, but you can also do that over the day. It doesn't matter, it's not like an optical telescope. So you can uh, technically scan 24 seven. It's supposed to be the driest place on earth. It's not quite true, it does know a lot. So often we need to stop uh, and um, you, you can quite observe, but pretty much you can observe uh, 24 seven. Here you can see a little bit more about the telescope, but the idea is that you can quite do this in space, right? Putting a six meter telescope uh, up on the, uh, you know, Lagrangian point two, that, that would be complicated to do, but you can do that from, uh, for example, from, from Chile. And so just for reference, uh, those are the two papers that are describing all uh, these results. And as I said, you can see that, you know, it's, we were published in 2020, we're in 2023. Uh, we haven't stopped analyzing data since we published these papers. It takes a really long time to actually get this, uh, these cosmological results out. And so I'm glad I can still be here and talk about this uh, because we were quite excited about it. Um, let me tell a little bit more about ACT. ACT really started in 2008. It's a very old telescope. And actually, sadly, it's not there anymore. We, we're taking it apart. ACT is over. Uh, it's a one continue observe. Uh, but it started in 2008, and the first instrument, the first camera was AMBAC. Only temperature, uh, you didn't have a way to observe the polarization, and observe the, the sky for three years over three frequencies, 150, 220, and 280 uh, gigahertz. After that, it was upgraded with a new camera, ACPO. Now we want to look at polarization. And you can see that every year they, because I haven't, they installed a new, a new optics tube, uh, 150, 150, and then these new technology, dichroic, where a single detector can see 90 and 150 gigahertz. And the idea of these two surveys here is that we were looking at two patches, uh, sorry, multiple small patches of the sky. We really wanted to go deep, being able to see the temperature and the polarization of the CMB. But then we realized, well, we are in Chile and we can really observe a, a big chunk of the sky. So with advanced act, we changed the detectors again uh, to make them better, but also we went to observe a large fraction, of the, large fraction of the sky. And so that's what we call advanced act. And now all the detectors arrays are dichroic, 9150, 9150. Here we observed the 220 as well. Again, temperature and polarization. And then around the 2020, we removed one and we put a low frequency. This is the, I'm pretty sure I'm correct. This is the uh, first high resolution low frequency survey, 30, 40 gigahertz that happens in, in, in this community. In Chile, class is observing, I believe at these frequencies as well, but that's very low resolution. Here, you're gonna get a lot of galactic science as well, a low frequency, very high resolution. And we're really excited to, to show this data uh, to the public at some point. Again, it's, it's new, so it takes time. And so for this act therefore that I'm gonna show you, we looked at the ACPO uh, data from 2013 to 2016. And it was a very heterogeneous group of, um, of data. And here, and, and I'll show you why. As I said, we made a transition where we went from small patches to really being able to see the signal to try to explore this, uh, you know, the possibility of looking at uh, almost half of the sky. And so over the years, we went wider and wider. In 2013, we looked at these small patches here. In 2014, uh, we we looked at this one, say larger in 2015. Then we went to overlap with BOSS because the nice thing about Chile is also you can do a lot of cross correlation analysis, especially with with reconstructing lensing. And then in 2016 we went with what we call advanced act. And the idea of advanced act is you need to do this over and over again over the years because you need to integrate down the noise. And so here won't be as exciting, but as you integrate down over the years, it will become more and more, and that's what it will bring with year six. But we looked at all this data. Uh, it took almost three years to analyze it. And that's what we see. So here I'm showing you uh, data from ACT. This is only temperature. And you see a 10 degree by 10 degree patch. And what you're really seeing here is, are density fluctuations in the universe as a redshift of 1100. What you're seeing here is the E mode map. So one of the components of the polarization, same patch. And what you're seeing here is a different aspect of it, is the velocity field. Of, of that primordial plasma. So you're looking at the same physics in a sense, but with two different probes. And that's very interesting when you're trying to um, test a cosmological model because the model will give you properties for both the density and the velocity. And if your data doesn't show agreement with these two, 
you can actually modify your theory. So we were really interested in made, making high resolution, high fidelity polarization maps that will give us the confidence that what we see is actually robust. And here I'm gonna flip back and forth if I can do this. In the second slide, we're adding Planck. And so you can see that in the temperature part, there is a big change. And that's because Planck is adding the large scales that are usually not very accessible from the ground because of the atmospheric noise. They are too noisy for us, but those are great in space. And you know, the large scale temperature, Planck has seen it, WMAP has seen it, we're pretty much done, and, but that's okay. Whereas, oh, sorry, you can see that there is not a big change in polarization. And that's because Planck is not very sensitive. So we bring to the table now the very first, uh, or at least one of the first um, uh, very sensitive measurements of the polarization of the CMB, where you can see that these maps are signal dominated in the map, not just in the power spectrum. And it will get just better and better. And here, basically what I just said, uh, the comparison of the fraction of the sky, you know, we look at half of the sky, Planck can see it all. We, we are much higher resolution. The temperature, as I mentioned before, Planck adds large scales that we cannot see, but we are we add a lot of astrophysics. Here you can see point sources and clusters that uh, uh, Planck is not able to resolve because of the resolution, but we're able to see. So there is a lot of astrophysics you can extract from this. And here you see the polarization. Planck is noise dominated in the maps. We, we, we are not anymore. We can actually see the polarization as the picture, uh, not just in their statistics. Okay, this is a very messy slide, uh, but I wanted to convince you about something. Um, our purpose was to test the Planck findings. And so we need to convince the community that what we've done is really robust. And one way to do that is to show that you can run a lot of different tests on your data, a lot of different cuts, a lot of different combinations. And all of these combinations, which should be frequency independent or optics tube independent, uh, the detector technology independent, everything shouldn't depend on how you build your instrument, right? And so we try to really build this paper to convince the community what we see is real, is there, and it doesn't matter how we combine our data, we see always the same thing. And so, as I said, over basically four years, you can see the different season here, we observed over four years, the same patches in some cases, and same frequencies, but with different optics tubes. And so you, you can basically see from this table that we're building in a way to do null tests, right? If you have a map at 150 gigahertz from this optics tube and you have another map at 150 gigahertz from this optics tube, the difference of it should be noise, right? The signal should go all the way. And so this is what I really want you to get out of, of this slide, the fact that we're building that sort of testing. And then it took us a long time because actually it takes a lot of effort to, to build all these tests and run it continuously. Um, we did observe 17,000 square degrees if you just look at which pixels were observed, but because of the depth, and as I said, you win on large fractions of the sky over time. Uh, if you actually try co to compute the effective area uh, for the, the power spectrum analysis, what you're really looking at is 5,000 square degrees. So I, I, I don't want to advertise that we looked at uh, data that give us basically the statistics of half of the sky, not quite. The, our depth is more like this but we're getting there and we'll get better. So this is what we see. Uh, we divided the data in two subgroups, what we call deep. So all the patches that we, we really went deep and the noise level is, is, is low. Uh, and we observed those at 90 and 150 gigahertz. And here you can see the temperature, the polarization, the, the cross correlation and E mode. Um, and uh, here you see our uh, best fit theory, including foregrounds. And so you see that uh, it matches uh, amazingly well. Uh, and this difference here is expected. It's just that you have um, radio sources that are emitting in the microwave. And of course, they're much brighter 98 gigahertz than 115. So that's why you see uh, this tail uh, being higher. And then the other part is what we call the wide. So the much shallower area. And the reason for doing this is just because once we mass, we need to mass some of these point sources, uh, otherwise our signal will be completely swamped by that. And in order to mask them at a comfortable level, um, you know, the deeper you go, the more of them you see. And so in the wide area, you see, we are able to uh, pick up a lot less of those. And so the tail is a lot higher. That's all you see here. And so you, you don't really see a difference in polarization, but in temperature, of course, you see a lot of it, but that's all expected, all these differences. Uh, but to do cosmology, we don't really care about all of this. And so the idea is that you can take this data and jointly solve for all your foregrounds parameters 
and also the uh, band powers of your power spectrum, solving for the band powers that are only the cosmology one. So you're basically marginalizing over your foregrounds, and that's what we did here. So you see the temperature. Now you see the deep and wide that are blue and light blue. They all agree because the foregrounds are gone. You see TE and you see EE, and of course they agree. One thing that I want you to uh, get away from this slide, you probably you can't quite see, is are the arrow bars. If we look at TE, for example. Uh, you see that, I mean, here you don't see a whole lot of difference, but here you see that the dark blue ones have much larger error bars than the uh, light ones. And the dark blue ones are the deep one, whereas the light blue are the white ones. And here, what you see is basically the effect of F sky. If you want to get these oscillations really narrowed down, you need to go wide. That's the idea. And so we already see that gain um, in, in error bar, even with this shallow survey, Remember that, again, this was initial data. So our survey was very shallow on, on half of the sky. And so this will get better and better and better. But that's the idea. If you want to constrain cosmology, especially beyond lambda CDM, you need to get these oscillations very well uh, measured. And that means you really want to go on a wide um, uh, sky area in order to get that working. And we already saw this effect. And so after, from Planck to DR4, this is the new situation. Here's what I showed you before, the Planck, then uh, all the other experiments. And then in 2020, we put out these results. And then you see that there is still beautiful agreement between, uh, between all experiments. And now we can, we basically have this beautiful measurement of the oscillations, um, both in EE, but even more importantly, in the cross correlation of the temperature and, and polarization here. And so, Let's take another look at uh, error bars uh, briefly. Um, here you see um, the, the three spectra that I showed you, and here what I'm plotting are the error bars. And I just wanted to compare basically the different experiments. Here you see uh, SPT in the South Pole versus ACT, and again, here you're seeing the effect of F sky. Uh, as you go larger, your, your um, error bars go down uh, around the acoustic peaks, and then of course, you pay a penalty because you have more noise. You need to integrate down that this. So this will eventually will go down, but of course it takes more time. Uh, same in TE and of course EE. And also you can see that Planck, of course it does beautifully well um, in temperature. It was meant to do that. Uh, whereas in polarization, you start seeing that ACT and SPT, the other experiments actually start kicking in and dominating Planck uh, very early on. And so all of these will get, will get better. But what about cosmology? So here I did this very silly exercise when I was thinking about this. Uh, we have the map, double map results, right? And if you take the, the lambda CDM parameter space from a double map chain, you have a hyper volume. And then I take two models in that uh, hypersphere basically that are roughly two sigma from the best fit model. Two sigma are pretty much in agreement with the best fit. And so I take these two models, I compute the power spectrum and I take the difference of those two theories. And then I divide it by the error bar of either Planck or ACT. So I'm trying to see what are the scales that really matter when I try to constrain cosmology and will help me understand which one is the most uh, likely model. And so you can see that in temperature, yeah, I, you can see something, uh, but ACT actually doesn't, doesn't add a whole lot on Planck. So, the temperature is not the real, the real game here. What we saw though is exactly in T. And you can see that for a large range of scales where those acoustic peaks are, you can see that the, the difference in these models is actually um, bigger than a sigma. And so you can see that the TE channel in ACT is actually the channel that is mostly constraining the differences in these models. And a little bit comes from polarization as well, but what really matters is TE. Let me show you that in parameter space. And there are a lot of points here, which I'll guide you through, but I want you for a moment to focus on this part. TT only constraints, T only constraints, and E only. You can see that those are the uh, lambda CDM parameters we, we constrain with our data. And you can see that TE always gives, pretty much always gives the smallest error bars. So here, the big thing comes from the fact that for ACTS DR4, the TE power spectrum is the one that is constraining cosmology the most. Whereas for Planck, the most constraining power comes from TT. So here we're building that, that test that I was saying before, 
that if Planck and ACT do agree with each other, this is also a test of cosmology. They agree with different channels. They agree on different scales. It's a completely independent test. Um, so this was something that we noticed and we're really happy about. Let me tell a little bit more about what we see here. We've done all sorts of tests. We looked at uh, the minimum amount, the, um, the largest scales. Yes, the largest scales you include in your analysis for temperature. That's what T-min means. Uh, also cutting different cuts for polarization. We looked at uh, single frequencies. Of course, if you, are, uh, if you are modeling your foregrounds in the right way, the cosmology should be uh, independent from, from those foregrounds. And so the frequency, the, the only differences will, will be in the foregrounds part. And so that's what we see. And also we check between deep and wide. As I said before, we have these two data sets we can look for consistency. And the green, the, the sorry, not green, the gray boxes here uh, tell you the, um, the range that you expect in variation of parameters coming from just random fluctuations. So if you run that over simulations, those are the possible ranges that you expect. And so as long as those points are within those gray boxes, uh, these fluctuations that you see are just random fluctuation of your, of your, or the fact that you're cutting the data. And so the noise is changing. And so from all of these parameter tests, what we see is that we have a consistent picture. Our cosmology that we derive from ACT is independent of where we look in the sky, is independent of frequency, is independent if you're looking at TT, TE, or EE only, uh, and is also independent of the, the different cuts that we do in the data. And so we're comfortable in, in what we find. And so what do we find? Well, we find that ACT, therefore, is also a very good fit uh, to Lambda CDM. We don't need, we really don't need extra parameters to describe what we see. And if you look at the consistency in a 5D parameter space between WMAP, Planck, and ACT, uh, you see that ACT versus WMAP or Planck are consistent within 2.3, 2.7 sigma. Again, this is in 5D parameter space, not for single parameter. And so you can see uh, the, the Lambda CDM parameters here. Uh, and let me show you H naught real quick. Uh, actually, I like it here. Um, you can see the value of, of H naught from ACT only, Planck, and when you combine ACT with WMAP. The idea of combining uh, ACT and WMAP is because we don't measure the large scales from, uh, from temperature. WMAP measures it very well. WMAP and Planck agree very well. And so we wanna, we, we wanna combine WMAP and ACT in order to get uh, things that are comparable to, basically apples to apples, comparable to, to Planck. And so you can see that all these parameters agree. So what we actually find is that the cosmology that Planck has measured uh, from, from the data uh, is the same as we measure with ACT. And that's expected to, to, to some extent if ACT and Planck uh, are not systematic dominated measurements. We are looking at the same sky, right? So there is no cosmic variance in that. Uh, we're looking at the same picture of the sky. The cosmology should be completely independent, uh, sorry, completely the same. The only thing that is different between these maps are is basically noise from the instrument, but cosmology should exactly be the same. Uh, and that's basically what, what we see. These experiments are completely consistent. And so if we go back to that plot, this is Planck. This is act therefore only, and this is when we add uh, WMAP large scale information. And so you see the baseline and we, we find basically the same value uh, with a bigger error bar at the moment. Uh, it takes a little bit uh, to, to narrow this down. Um, and so we confirm the same tension uh, with the Cepheids measurement that Planck has seen before. But now the story is different. It's not a tension between Planck and the Cepheids. Is a tension between CMB measurement and the Cepheids. The CMB at this point is pretty robust. That's the value of H naught that we find. It's very unlikely that Planck and ACT have the same systematics effect. Completely different telescopes on completely different locations in the universe, uh, and um, it's um, it's a very robust measurement. As I said before, uh, one of the biggest excitement about the future of CMB from the ground is actually not Lambda CDM. Planck has done it all. Pretty much, as I said, you can look in, in uh, polarization to constrain those parameters better, but you know it's it, you can do more. And what we want to do is actually going beyond lambda CDM. So we tried a little bit with ACT gear four. Planck was seeing a little bit of negative curvature, uh, again consistent with zero, uh, but you know th there was this distribution. We don't see anything in ACT. It looks very flat. 
that's a compliment, I guess, for the universe. I don't know, but uh, that's what we see. Uh, we looked at neutrinos, the sum of neutrino masses. We don't have enough constraining power at the moment, but that was a fun test to do, mostly for uh, for systematics checks. Uh, we look at the uh, number of effective neutrinos, and we also look at the running of the spectral index. Uh, and here you can uh, argue that um, ACT is showing some running. Uh, all of these parameters are consistent within two and a half sigma with the expectations. Uh, but that's what we see from ACT only. When you add the large scale information from WMAP is brought back to here. Uh, and so with more data, what I can tell you from all of this is that if there is something strange, at the moment you cannot say anything uh, you cannot say that anything uh, goes beyond lambda CDM at, at a level that is bigger than uh, 2 to 2.5. Everything is consistent with this. More data will tell us more. If actually we have running, when we go beyond DR4 with ACT, we will be able to shrink these error bars and actually make a detection of something, or maybe this will go down if it's just a noise fluctuation. So there is a lot more to say um, and say with, um, with, the, uh, with the following one. Here, more of a compilation plot of uh, also the, the extension that I mentioned with different combinations. So if you're interested in this in like Lambda CDM and extensions, you can find this on the paper as well, uh, if there is anything, your favorite parameter. And one thing that I do wanted to mention is that we haven't done it everything you can do, uh, but we make these things public. So you can go online, you can download maps, you can download likelihoods, you can download almost everything that we we use for our papers. There are so many data products. It was such a pain to put them online, but it's it's amazing. And someone with the Act actually created notebooks to show you how to use those data products, uh, how to load them, how to make plots and things like that. And so we hope that if you do have a favorite uh, cosmological model, uh, maybe this data can start help telling you, you know, you can use it and say, yeah, um, maybe it's, you know, worth exploring more uh, and just, um, do forecasts or actually see what the, your parameters that you're trying to introduce are uh, for um, given this data. So everything is, is public and we hope that, uh, we already know that many people have used it uh, and published papers with this and uh, it, a lot more will, will come online as, uh, as we continue analyzing the data. So let me tell you a little bit of what's coming next. Uh, I won't be able to show you results, we, I mean, we know what's going on within the collaboration, but it's not public yet. Uh, but um, we already went a little bit beyond DR4. Uh, we already, you will find online also what we call ACT DR5. And I like to call this an astronomer data release. And what, what that means is that we made maps of what was DR4 and we added this little bit of data as well. So it became a lot bigger on, on a large part of the sky. The thing is that th the quality of these maps is not good yet to do cosmology with it. You cannot do parameter estimation. But we realized that it was actually good to find clusters. It was actually good to do point source analysis. And so we said, why don't we put it out for the public, the public that is not a cosmologist, but is actually an astronomer, an astrophysics, astro astrophysicist, and might want to do um, other sort of science at that wavelength. And so we put that out. That's what I mean by an astronomer. Don't try to take a power spectrum and do cosmology and find a running to be four. We said we told you that you should not have done that, but you can definitely look at small scales analysis, for example, for classes and point sources, and you'll do great. But then what's coming next is DR6. So it's the full advanced act survey and 90, 150, and 220. And this is uh, this is an amazing survey. Uh, I'll show you in a second why. It's because of this. So here you see the the map depth so this is the noise that you have in the maps uh as function of the cumulative error so how much of that map has that noise basically so what i showed you so far was dr4 and you can see that dr4 is very uneven because of that wedding cake uh layout that we had where we were patching the sky first and then go wide and so you see that you start with very low noise 10 mu k arc minute but then you rapidly go up and you see that this is the if you co add all the frequencies from Planck, that's the, the noise level. And you can see that you are below Planck's noise level only for roughly the 5,000 square degrees that I mentioned before. Then with your five, the astronomer only one, you actually bring this curve down and you have that you're better than Planck, uh, you know, what is that? Uh, a little bit over 16,000. But then with ACDR6, you see that you're better than Planck almost on the entire patch that we observe, uh, more than 18,000 square degrees. And the other thing is that it becomes extremely flat. So you're always good all over. 
and so it's becoming very deep uh, on half of the sky, a lot better than Planck. And that's what I said. Then now we're able, we're going to be able to actually constrain uh, cosmology, especially beyond lambda CDM, a lot better. The data volume is huge. Uh, it's 10 times DR4, and this takes a lot of time to analyze. And I want to publicly thank Canada for the computing infrastructure that they have, because that's how we do it in ACT. So thanks, Canada. <laughs> Um, uh, yeah, and that's what I said. We, we, we basically went beyond Planck on a big patch of the sky. So this is the exciting part. It's not data, uh, but at least you can get a flavor of what we, we're getting. Let's start with this part. Here is the EE power spectrum, and here you have the TE power spectrum. The blue points are the DR4 results uh, that, we, that, I, that I showed you before. The red ones are is a simulation of what we expect from DR6. So you can see that those are all aligned because the, the value is the, the, the theory best fit that we use to simulate, but those are the expected error bars that we expect on the data. And you can see how um, narrow those beans are. Those are not final, some changes may happen, but the point is that the fact that we are observing such a large fraction of the sky with a small noise, we are able to basically resolve a lot of these modes. And actually you can afford to reduce your beaning and still have independent beans. And that helps in your constraints. So you can see that the data got so good that now you can basically look at the power spectrum even without plotting a theory. You, you can see how your theory looks like. And so those are the expected error bars and roughly beaning that we, that we expect from DR6. And then um, the data will tell us what the mean value is. And here a little bit of forecasting. So for example, for H0, uh, DR4 plus WMAP, we found plus or minus 1.1 in agreement with Planck. Planck was 1.5. Uh, and if we combine DR6 with Planck, we should find 0.4. Uh, for NS, uh, also there is an improvement uh, from 0.6, well, 0 0.006, 4, 3, and also for N effective. As I said before, Lambda CDM doesn't do much with this. I think that the interesting part is going to be that now temperature and polarization are really going to have the same constraining power. And so we can test Lambda CDM at that level, but the beyond Lambda CDM is the, is the money here. And it's not just about power spectrum, uh, especially if you work in large scale structure, uh, I'm pretty sure you're excited about cross correlations uh, between your favorite large scale structure survey and ACT DR6. Uh, now with these high resolution and low noise, half of the sky maps, we can reconstruct the map of the integrated mass of the universe uh, looking at the CMB. And so here you see that map, this is a preliminary version, uh, minus the galaxy, of course. And here you see a cutout of that. In uh, black and white, you see the lensing map. So those are the over densities and under densities. And the contours are showing you the high frequency channels of Planck, which are tracing the CIB. CIB and lensing are highly correlated because they're tracing the same structures roughly with the same kernel. And you can see that this, these two things agree. And so you are actually seeing signal. This is not a uh, noise dominated lensing map anymore. You're actually seeing the universe uh, integrated over uh, your line of sight. And here a little bit more in the power spectrum. This is the, the theory lensing power spectrum. And here you see the noise level from Planck. And it's already amazing. The Planck measurement of lensing was, was impressive. It's still impressive. And you can see what we're going to bring with year six. Now we have that our power spectrum is a signal dominated from very low, uh, um, very large scales in Lansing uh, down to you know a little bit over a few hundreds here, and then of course explode more. But you see the impressive um, improvement between the Planck and uh, what we're going to bring with year six over uh, half of the sky. And as I mentioned, it's not just about power spectrum and lensing. There is a lot of small scales physics that you can do, and uh, I guess astrophysics you can do, which you really couldn't do with Planck at this level before. This is actually coming from that DR5 re uh, release, the, the astronomer one that I mentioned. Uh, and each cross here is a cluster that we find through the SZ effect. And here you can see those clusters, well, their mass as function of the redshift, and what I wanted to bring is the point that being high resolution on a lot of the sky gives you a lot of this point, a lot more that you could hope from Planck and a lot more that you can hope from um, 
uh, ground-based service that actually cannot see that much of the sky. So you can do a lot of cluster cosmology here uh, with, with these surveys. And we find roughly 4,000 uh, clusters with, um, with DR5. With DR6, since they're a lot deeper, you expect roughly 1,000 more. So it's going to be exciting. So I hope that I convince you that um, ACT is an exciting experiment. As I mentioned, uh, it's done. It's not running anymore. And they took it apart. Uh, everyone signed uh, uh, on a piece of the, the mirror. Actually, I haven't. I should go to Princeton and do it. Um, but uh, ACT is done. We're not going to operate it anymore. The analysis will continue, uh, especially because we haven't shown anything about the low-frequency data, which is going to be important. So I think that for the next year or two, you'll hear a lot about uh, ACT still until we pause it. But then we're very excited because we're not going to relax because we have the Simmons Observatory coming up. So this is an even bigger collaboration. Is a new brand new observatory funded by the Science Foundation, the Heising Science Foundation in Chile. And it brings the ACT collaboration and the polar bear collaboration to work together and basically do everything you can in cosmology, inflation, uh, acoustic peaks, everything. And that's done with uh, different telescopes. So here is the plateau, the side that I showed you before, ACT class polar bear. And this is a rendering of how a soil is going to look like uh, with its telescopes, um, containers, uh, the lab, uh, a lot of different things. Uh, in terms of telescopes, uh, as so as one large aperture telescope, this is pretty much like ACT, uh, is enclosed. It's a, it's a better designed telescope now that we know what we really want to do. And here you see the telescope fully done uh, at Vertex in Germany uh, while it was testing. I can tell you that actually the telescope has reached the plateau, uh, taken apart, uh, but it's all up there. And so they're starting to put it together and if everything goes well, soon we'll be moving the telescope and verify that it actually works. And then we have small aperture telescopes. Those are for inflationary science, mostly. They're going to look at large scale polarization. And the initial plan for SO was to have three of those. Now, SO UK was awarded, well, the UK, the, the UK consortium was awarded a pretty uh, large amount of money. And they're bringing two new uh, small aperture telescopes to SO that makes it five. And the same happened to Japan. So now this became six and those are funded. So SO will have one of these and six of these instead of three. And, but the first three that were paid by original SO, they're actually at the site moving. So the site is coming up. Um, we are expected to get data first light very, very soon. Uh, and here also shout out, I don't understand anything of this. Those are detectors, I, I, I wish I could. <laughs> They're just amazing though. And the even more amazing thing is that this stuff is built by students. I don't know how they do it, but it works. And um, here you see the, the small aperture telescope uh, receiver that goes here and here the large aperture telescope receiver. This thing is huge, it's very heavy, it's also now at the site. And again, students and grad students and, and postdocs have built this with of course the guidance of amazing people that have done this for a while, but I don't know, it's, it's just impressive to me. So I just wanted to uh, show the amazing work that they do. And what we plan to do, well, for the SAT, uh, we want to do 10% of the sky, very low dust. Again, this is very focused on B mode searches. So we, we just need to do one thing, we need to do it well. Uh, whereas for the LAT, um, we want to observe that half of the sky, 40%, uh, but we're really pushing it a lot um, higher. And the main science will actually come from large scale structure surveys overlap. Uh, what's the science? Primordial perturbations, neutrino mass, relativistic species, reionization, dark energy, galaxy evolution, transients, basically everything you want to do uh, with, uh, with all of this. And one thing that we're really paying a lot of attention to is making all of this data public and available to anyone, not just if you're part of SO, uh, very timely so that you can go ahead and do your own analysis and look at your cosmological model. Uh, as Zach said, uh, I lead the data management, so I also want to give a shout out to the team that works with me. And just to give you an idea, what we do in data management is um, you build an instrument and you need to operate it uh, with software. So we cover all the software to control that instrument, all the telescopes and the accumulation of data and the streaming of data, all the way to making those CMB maps that I mentioned. After those CMB maps are made, we give them to what we call the analysis working groups in SO, um, which are the groups responsible to take this analysis and, and tell us what the cosmology is, what the astrophysics is. So uh, in, within the data management, we're basically responsible for 
anything from once the photons hit the, the detectors, then it comes to us and we finish when we, we get beautiful maps out of it. And there is an amazing team of many people uh, across the globe working on this, a lots of different students, uh, including here. And it's just, I mean, it's been, it's been amazing. And in the next year, um, when we're supposed to deliver everything, uh, the next few months are just gonna be crazy. Uh, for all of us to get to get this together, but it's nice to always uh, work with uh, people that are really dedicated and and they they love what they do. Um, all this uh, software, the software we're creating is public, uh, and so uh, that is also I think very important because future collaborations might be using this. Uh, and it's because if you're a student or a postdoc, you may want to put your stuff public and not uh, you know uh, have it hidden somewhere before uh, the project ends. So. Um, if you want to know more about what we do in SO, let me know afterwards. I just didn't want to bother you with the details, uh, but that's basically what I've been doing uh, for the past three years. And hopefully once we start getting data, the talks will become a lot more interesting than show you lines of codes. Uh, but one thing that I'm very interested um, that is, uh, at least to me, the brand new things about CMB experiments is this time domain astronomy. Uh, I like to call them CMB experiments, but that's really wrong. It's not a CMB experiment. It's a, you know, it's a microwave experiment. That's what it measures, it measures a given frequency, right? And yeah, sure, you can do, you can do CMB cosmology with it. Uh, we've been doing it for many years, but it's not all about it. There is astrophysics, but it's also all this time domain astronomy. And the thing is that with things like SO, we can look at the sky, the, the half of the sky that I mentioned, basically every two or three nights. And so if you're fast enough to make maps of the sky every two or three nights, you can, you can tell if there were things that went off and then they disappeared. And if you work in LSST, time domain astronomy is something that you hear every day. Uh, if you work in CMB, these things is kind of new. And so it's exciting because now you, you kind of need to reinvent how you think about the experiment. Um, we, you know, we, you need to think about what's the best strategy to observe the sky in order to maximize this kind of science, to being able to sample the sky evenly uh, overnight. How do you, how do you look at the data in a way that you don't wash out these transient signals? Because when you make a map, the, the basic assumption of making a CMB map is that your sky doesn't change. And so anything that is changing will actually average down because of the method you picked. Now you actually want to do the opposite. Things that have appeared and disappeared, I want them to pop up. How do I do that? And so this, this thing I, I find it very interesting is, is the new challenge in terms of developing the pipeline for uh, a microwave experiment. And it's very much an explore territory. We don't know what we're going to find. Uh, ACT has seen a few events, mostly are uh, stars that flare. Cool. Uh, they, they, they're fantastic and we're going to find a ton of those, but there could be a lot of other stuff that we haven't seen in the microwave sky uh, that hopefully will, will pop up. And so transients is one of those, but here in this plot you can actually see using ACT data, uh, you can see flux limits for a planet night search. So now you want to use this data and, and look at the parameter space of your orbits for uh, uh, planet nine and ask what is the flux limit as function of the location uh, for such a planet like this. So the, here we, you sort of need to reinvent again your pipeline and think out of the box and say, how do I actually search a moving object with data like this that wasn't following any object, it's just looking at the sky randomly. And again, you need to stack them up in a way that your signal would not go away. Uh, so this was work that Sigur Ness did and I, I just find it uh, uh, very fascinating. And, uh, if you're interested in this, I would suggest this paper. It was, it's very nicely written. And for SO, we are, we are aiming to do this. And specifically, we put a proposal to NSF uh, and propose what we call Advanced Simons Observatory. So I showed you SO being one LAT and three uh, um, SATs, so this is a small aperture telescopes. The LAT, the cryostat, can actually host 13 optics tubes. Uh, we had money only for six in SO nominal. And so with Advanced Simons Observatory, we want to, uh, we propose to NSF to help us fill out all the 13 of six tubes so that we can, we have more integration power for, uh, for this large aperture telescope and being able to uh, look at the sky and instantaneously have more sensitivity to do that. We asked to give us basically money to develop within data management new pipelines to highlight the science 
uh, and understand how we can best process the data to find transients. Uh, but also, if everything goes well with that proposal, uh, to make SO a green observatory, uh, which means NSF would be paying for a solar array uh, that can uh, basically run the observatory uh, instead of dumping in the atmosphere a ton of um, uh, pollution because of diesel generation. Uh, that's how we've been doing CMB cosmology from well, the pole or anything, anywhere pretty much. Uh, and as much as this is a um, very important thing to do, uh, we also know that global warming is an important thing that we need to take care of. And so making this observatory green would actually be uh, a big achievement, especially because now we have seven telescopes and they use a lot of diesel. So uh, this proposal was put in, is under review by NSF, and hopefully if they say yes, uh, we'll start making it green, but also we'll make it more powerful with, with more detectors and, and look at transients. So I guess I'm going to conclude. Um, with, with ACT, we were able to confirm the cosmology from Planck. So the especially when it comes to H0, the CMB measurement of the H0 parameter, I think at this point is very robust. ACT, Planck, and WMAP uh agree on on the cosmology and the others of h naught and we'll we'll continue improving a little bit uh moving forward uh with dr6 we'll be moving beyond Planck, uh constraining power and this is very interesting for beyond lambda cdm actions whatever you have in mind that can be probed through cmb act dr6 will likely give a bigger kick that you will get with Planck uh, analysis and i guess in the next two or three years we will wrap up act but Simon's Observatory will have first light, hopefully this year. I mean, without hopefully, we'll have first light this year. And uh, we'll, the science observations are due to start in mid-2024. And for a so nominal, we have a five-year observation um, program. But if NSF does agree to uh, send forward advanced uh, SO, advanced Simon's Observatory, we'll upgrade the lot, but also observe for five, uh, five more years. And really means that SO as a full observatory will observe for a total of 10 years. So, um, you know, we'll be uh, hearing a lot about uh, SO for, um, for basically the next decade. And again, there will be a lot of cosmology, there will be a lot of astrophysics, but even very exciting will be a lot of unexplored time domain astronomy that uh, has been um, pioneered by uh, people in the uh, optical community. And I think we can do a lot more from uh, the microwave. And it's 4.01 p.m., so I think I'm going to stop. We have time for maybe one or two questions, and then we can uh, disperse. OK. Um, if the ASO proposal goes through, um, how soon could the solar panel system start to be set up? And also, do you think that could be a model for other observatories in the future? Okay, so the timeline, I'm not exactly sure, um, because, of course, we these observatories are not on U.S. land. And so as much as this is beneficial to Chile and, uh, in general, the you know the environment, uh, it does take a little bit of time to set things up uh, to make things work properly. Uh, the, the little bit of the challenge is that these solar panels will not be next to the telescopes. You actually need to put them somewhat far uh, in a place that doesn't give any disturbance and then you, you bring the, the power up. So I don't have an exact timeline uh, for you. Um, I think that by the 2025, if this uh, um, uh, proposal is approved in the short term, uh, by 2025, we should start having something working for the, the solar array. Um, I'm not quite sure exactly though the, the full timeline to make it you know, fully working and, and green. Um, in terms of model, I hope so. Uh, that, would be, that would be amazing. Um, I saw it's still at the size where this is possible. Things like Alma, uh, which is a lot bigger, might be might be problematic. But I think in terms of making the plateau green, and so having SO and other experiments that will be joining uh, basically green, I think would be feasible and SO would be a proof of concept. Something that definitely as for Chile will probably adopt if this is working. Diesel is also extremely expensive. 
So apart from the environment, this saves a lot of money to the project if you can run on solar panels. Most of the operation cost for an observatory is actually burning diesel. So they go to waste. I mean, they don't go to waste. We use it for power, but like <laughs> you're literally burning money uh, to make it work. Uh, when you showed the CMB lensing noise curve compared to Planck, um, like there's that pickup roughly, I guess, around like 200, uh, L of 200 ish. So I'm curious, like what is causing the, yeah, like the noise to sort of like uh, pick up around that scale. And for something like SO, what strategies would you, I guess, use, like, could you like actually like, like reduce that? Like what, uh, how do you actually beat down the noise? Um, yeah. So I, I'm going to give you an answer, but I, I uh, let me, so there is definitely a resolution component to it. And that's mostly what you would expect from, you know, uh, Planck and difference between Planck and ACT. In terms of SO, you will not see a big improvement for that because the primary mirror for ACT and the SO lab are pretty much the same. So there is not a big improvement. Map noise does matter. Um, the more you go here, the more you're looking at the larger leg, right? It's really looking at the difference between uh, small L for your capital L. So you're trying to couple large scales and, and small scales. Uh, for um, this specifically, when you reconstruct lensing from temperature, one of the big issues for, our, for us are is the noise on large scales, right? Because there's a lot of atmosphere. Planck doesn't have start to become good and good better at the at mapping the polarization that issue becomes a lot less of a problem it is so the combination of having really good depth in your maps um, making the polarization very sensitive doesn't really matter will, could help that that part to be more with for example cmb and hd proposal that's high resolution and that could also help you more and more of this because again you're probing level arm that you need for